give a brief um, statement and then we go on to discuss it. Well, for clarity's sake, I divide the argument <coughs> into distinct stages. Uh, first of all, I should say, we know that there are at least some beings in the world which do not contain in themselves the reason for their existence. For example, I depend on my parents and now on the air, on the food, and so on. Now, secondly, the world is simply the real or imagined totality or aggregate of individual objects. This evening's participants, then, are professionally trained, well-published scholars. They know that either God exists or else God does not exist. They disagree about where the truth of that matter lies. Our debate format is simple. There are four rounds of descending length. Two 20-minute opening statements, two 12-minute comments on the opening statements, two eight-minute responses to the previous remarks, and two five-minute closing statements. After a very brief break, we will begin a half-hour session of questions and answers. There's no need for me to make any further introductions, and Professor Craig and Flew will proceed through the four phases of their remarks without any interruption. Then I will formally close the debate and shortly thereafter open the question and answer session. It is then my genuine pleasure to introduce Professor William Craig and Professor Anthony Flew. As is traditional, the affirmative side starts. Let the debate begin. Good evening. I want to begin by expressing my thanks for the privilege of participating in this event on the 50th anniversary of the famous Copleston Russell debate. And it's a special honor to be sharing the platform tonight with Professor Flew. Now, in order to determine rationally whether or not God exists, we need to conduct our inquiry according to the basic rules of logic and ask ourselves two fundamental questions. Number one, are there good reasons to think that God exists? And number two, are there good reasons to think that he does not? Now with respect to that second question, I'll leave it up to Dr. Flew to present the reasons why he thinks that God does not exist. But notice that although atheist philosophers have tried for centuries to disprove the existence of God, no one's ever been able to come up with a successful argument. So rather than attack straw men at this point, I'll just wait to hear Dr. Flew's answer to the following question. What good arguments are there to show that God does not exist? Let's look then at the first question. Are there good reasons to think that God exists? Tonight, I'm going to present five reasons why I think theism is more plausibly true than atheism. Whole books have been written on each of these, so I can only present here a brief sketch of each argument and then go into more detail as Dr. Flew responds to them. These reasons are independent of one another, and taken together, they constitute a powerful cumulative case for the existence of God. Number one, then, the origin of the universe. Have you ever asked yourself where the universe came from? Why anything at all exists instead of just nothing? Typically, atheists have said that the universe is just eternal and uncaused. As Russell remarked to Copleston, the universe is just there, and that's all. But is that really all? If the universe never began to exist, then that means that the number of events in the past history of the universe is infinite. But mathematicians recognize that the existence of an actually infinite number of things leads to self-contradictions. For example, what is infinity minus infinity? Well, mathematically, you get self-contradictory answers. This shows that infinity is just an idea in your mind, not something that exists in reality. David Hilbert, perhaps the greatest mathematician of this century, states, 
The infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. The role that remains for the infinite to play is solely that of an idea. But that entails that since past events are not just ideas, but are real, the number of past events must be finite. Therefore, the series of past events can't go back forever. Rather, the universe must have begun to exist. This conclusion has been confirmed by remarkable discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics. The astrophysical evidence indicates that the universe began to exist in a great explosion called the Big Bang 15 billion years ago. Physical space and time were created in that event, as well as all the matter and energy in the universe. Therefore, as the Cambridge astronomer Fred Hoyle points out, the Big Bang theory requires the creation of the universe from nothing. This is because as you go back in time, you reach a point at which, in Hoyle's words, the universe was shrunk down to nothing at all. Thus, what the Big Bang model requires is that the universe began to exist and was created out of nothing. Now, this tends to be very awkward for the atheist. For as Anthony Kenny of Oxford University urges, a proponent of the Big Bang theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came from nothing and by nothing. But surely that doesn't make sense. Out of nothing, nothing comes. So why does the universe exist instead of just nothing? Where did it come from? There must have been a cause which brought the universe into being. We can summarize our argument thus far as follows. Premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. Now from the very nature of the case as the cause of space and time, this cause must be an uncaused, timeless, changeless, and immaterial being of unimaginable power which created the universe. Moreover, I would argue it must also be personal. For how else could a timeless cause give rise to a temporal effect like the universe? If the cause were an impersonal set of necessary and sufficient conditions, then the cause could never exist without the effect. If the cause were timelessly present, then the effect would be timelessly present as well. The only way for the cause to be timeless and for the effect to begin to exist in time is for the cause to be a personal agent who freely chooses to create an effect in time without any prior determining conditions. Thus, we are brought not merely to a transcendent cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. Isn't it incredible that the Big Bang Theory thus confirms what the Christian theist has always believed, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? Now, I simply put it to you, which do you think makes more sense? That the theist is right, or that the universe just popped into being uncaused out of nothing. I at least don't have any trouble assessing these alternatives. Number two, the complex order in the universe. During the last 30 years, scientists have discovered that the existence of intelligent life depends upon a delicate and complex balance of initial conditions simply given in the Big Bang itself. We now know that life prohibiting universes are vastly more probable than any life permitting universe like ours. How much more probable? Well, the answer is that the chances that the universe should be life permitting are so infinitesimal as to be incomprehensible and incalculable.